reactions, the combustion of the olefin, and also the direct combustion of the alkane. But for today, we're going to focus only on the desired reaction, which is reaction one over here, the oxidative dehydrogenation. And we're going to ask about how the structure of the dispersed vanadium affects this first rate coefficient. So we have prepared vanadium on alumina catalysts using a variety of sources. And what we find is that as we vary the loading of vanadium onto the alumina, the structure evolves in a systematic fashion. So that at very low loadings, here we see evidence for isolated vanadate species. As you go to higher loadings, you get polyvanadates. These are two-dimensional structures that look like strings and eventually like sheets. Uh, at the end of this, you can make a monolayer of vanadium, and immediately you start growing three-dimensional structures that have the characteristics of B2O5 nanocrystallites. So notice that the loadings are expressed in units of vanadium atoms per square nanometer. So below two, you have monovanidates. Uh, above two, polyvanidates. And above seven or so, you begin to form crystals. And we ask whether this has any impact on catalysis. And I show you here that it very definitely does. Propane in green, ethane in blue. This is the oxidative dehydrogenation, the rate of forming the olefin per unit of uh, vanadium on the left. We'll look at that first. And what you see is that if you start with low loadings, where you principally have monovanadates, and you go to higher loadings, where you approach a monolayer of you know, polyvanadate on the alumina surface, the activity per vanadium increases by a factor of four in both cases. And then it reaches a peak, and after that, the site-specific activity begins to decline. And this is the area where you start to form three-dimensional structures. And we can explain this very simply by looking at the aerial-based rate, or so the rate based on the area of the catalyst. And you find that here again, it rises, and then it plateaus. And it even incorporates the points here and here for bulk vanadium, which is not supported. <coughs> So we see that the activity increases to the point where we now have a monolayer. And after that, you get no further increase because you're only putting more vanadium on, but it's inaccessible. Now, we wanted to understand why the rate changes as we change the loading. And so one of the tools that gives you some insight is UV ultraviolet visible spectroscopy. And this has been practiced in our laboratory in situ. Here's a little cartoon of a cell, a little bit of catalyst here. Photons come in. They're scattered over this, uh, off this catalyst pellet and then out for analysis. And what we see is this kind of spectrum. And if you extrapolate the linear portion here back to zero, you get what is called the energy band gap or the uh, energy uh, absorption energy. Uh, over here, and that provides you a measure of the transfer or ease of transferring electrons from oxygen, the HOMO orbitals, to vanadium in the LUMO orbitals. So it's a measure of how easy it is to cross this band gap. Now the question is, uh, how does this relate to catalysis? I'll show you that here. Here is the absorption edge energy. Here is the surface density. And you can see there's a systematic decline in that energy band gap. So if you go to the monovanidates, they have a high band gap. B205 at the other end has a band gap that is lower. It's about two electron volts. And then if you cross plot the data from here and from the previous slide, you can look at the rate of, in this case, propene formation versus the band edge energy shown as a declining quantity. And you have here a sudden logarithmic plot and a straight line on such a plot. So what it infers, just empirically, is the smaller the band gap over here, uh, the smaller is the, or the smaller the edge energy, absorption edge energy, the higher the activity. And in separate experiments, we've shown that this also correlates with an enhanced uh, uh, ease of reduction, or facility for reduction. So to get even further insight and to ask why is there this relationship, what we've done is to begin thinking about the chemistry here. And this is shown in cartoon form. Uh, in this case, we're looking at ethane as the example. 
uh, some sort of re uh, a reversible physisorption over here, a very weak absorption to get the ethane, the alkane onto the surface, then a difficult step in which we transfer this hydrogen to one of these vanadyl groups to make an OH and an alkoxide here. And then the, the, uh, uh, this is the rate limiting step, we believe. And then you remove a second hydrogen uh, very rapidly, and you go around the cycle. But I just want to focus on this piece of the cycle at the moment. So you see that the first interaction, as we conceive of it, is in involving a transfer of a hydrogen from this uh, weakly absorbed alkane. So here's that bit of the cartoon again, and showing the critical bond breaking step. <clears throat> and so why should there be a correlation between the activity and the band edge energy? And our interpretation is that the, the more basic or the easier it is to reduce the vanadium center by transferring an electron up here, the easier it will be to pluck one of the hydrogens off the catalyst surface. And as a way of uh, validating that intuition, <clears throat> we have done density functional calculations here of bringing propane, in this case, up to a little cluster representing part of the polyvanadate. And what we find is that, as one might expect, the weakest bond is the CH in the methylene unit. It transfers first to the vanadyl and across the gap here. <coughs> and eventually, <coughs> excuse me, that proton ends up on the second vanadyl. And what we have here is an isopropoxide group attached to vanadium. And that it is the CH bond of the, iso, uh, of the, uh, of the methylene group that is transferred is also indicated by isotopic labeling studies in which we compare the behavior of a perhydrogenated structure to one involving deuterium at the ends. There's no kinetic isotope effect here, saying that uh, changing from deuterium to hydrogen has no effect on the catalysis. But if we label the center carbon atom of deuterium versus hydrogen, uh, then we see a normal kinetic isotope effect. Things go faster with the hydrogenated reactant, which is indicative then that uh, transfer of a hydrogen atom is kinetically important. So we take this and now we extend the mechanism. So we have the transfer of the second hydrogen to release the olefin. We get two hydroxides. They condense to give us a reduced center and release water. And then we have the rapid reoxidation. And at this point, we assume that this reversible step is at equilibrium. Uh, and this is uh, uh, the rate limiting step. Uh, this one is also irreversible. And that this step involving water is reversible and at equilibrium. And that reoxidation is very rapid. So if you put these pieces together, you get a closed form rate expression, which I'm showing you in the box over here. It's uh, first order in the numerator in ethane. And in the denominator, if the water partial pressure is low, you have nothing but a unity here. As the water partial pressure builds up, you build up an inverse dependence on water and a more complicated dependence on both ethane and oxygen. Uh, does this work? Yes, it does. Here's a, what is called a parity plot. It shows you have near perfect agreement between experiment and this theoretical representation. But the only thing you can extract from the uh, fitting the rate expression to the data is this rate coefficient or product of a rate coefficient for the rate limiting step and the equilibrium constant. You can't find out anything about the rate of reoxidation, which is captured in this uh, rate coefficient K5. So we wanted to get further insight into this. We really wanted to tear apart all of the chemistry here. So we now want to look at this reoxidation step and ask, how could we get a handle on that? <clears throat> Well, to see what we did, you have to understand that there's another change that happens. There's a change that happens here in the UV visible spectrum when thing, the catalyst is under reaction conditions. We see an increase in the absorption in this uh, pre-edge region where you have E to D electron transitions. And the higher we do, the, the more we do a reduction, the greater we see the uh, change here in this absorption pre-edge feature. In fact, we can do some intentional reduction and look at the change in that pre-edge feature. And you see there's a linear correlation 
And this correlation applies to various catalysts with various amounts of vanadium on their surface. Now it turns out that in the working catalyst, we're working just in this corner, which extrapolates uh, to zero. So how do we take advantage of this? <clears throat> So I mentioned earlier that you have to do transient response experiments if you want to get all the details. <coughs> so let me guide you through the various panels. The first one, again, is our experimental setup. And now, on the inlet side, instead of working always at steady state, what we're going to do is, with time here on this axis, work at a fixed oxygen partial pressure and first a fixed uh, concentration of the alkane, in this case propane, for about 300 seconds. Watch what happens, let things come to steady state. And then we'll do a series of jumps where we increase incrementally the partial pressure of the reductant for 300 seconds, then do it again and again and again. And what we're monitoring is the change in this pre-edge absorbance as a function of time. Now, if you do an analysis of what is going on, you discover that the principal thing that is changing is the concentration of reduced sites, and it can be represented by this differential rate equation over here, which has a number of parameters. It has this epsilon 4, which is a ratio of rate coefficients and equilibrium constant. It has K1 times K2, which is the effective ODH rate coefficient. <coughs> And it has a constant over here that just depends on the selectivity of the catalyst. But fortunately, <coughs> this constant, or this parameter, doesn't change as a function of the experiment. So here's in black, the, or in blue, I can't tell from here, uh, the experimental data. It's the one that has the noise on it, I'm outlining. And we can fit this differential equation by adjusting the parameters to give the trajectory results here where we start, and in this particular preparation, you can see peaks for tetragonal zirconia, a little bit of evidence for monoclinic. In fact, if I were to show you the infrared spectrum of the hydroxyl groups, they look more like those found on monoclinic zirconia than tetragonal. And this is a consequence of producing a structure that has a core of tetragonal uh, zirconia with a partial shell of <coughs> clinic. So you move on, and this goes through the phase transformations. But more importantly, what does this do for catalysis? So on the abscissa in both cases here is the fraction of substitution of cereal for zirconia. Here none, and here 100%. And you see you can dial in the activity of the catalyst, going from about 1 in the unit shown on the left here to 4. So you get a factor of 4 increase. Uh, if you want to compare this to pure tetragonal, it's here. Remember, this is a kind of a hybrid, and pure monoclinic is here. So you do even better than the pure monoclinic. And if you take your worst catalyst relative to your best, you've gone uphill by a factor of 16. And for people who have an industrial uh, bent, uh, the unit of uh, merit here is grams of methanol per kilogram of catalyst per hour. And in those units, this most active catalyst is 420, which puts it in the high end of performance of uh, commercial uh, methanol synthesis catalysts. And it gives you high, this catalyst also gives you high selectivity. We're up at about 98% peak selectivity, which is also uh, very good. The only counterproduct is methane. Uh, there are no other alcohols. So we've looked a little bit about <coughs> what is going on here. We find from in situ uh, Zanes, that all the copper is in fact reduced, but 60% of the cerium uh, is uh, not in the plus four state, it's in the plus three state. So cerium goes from plus four when it was uh, first introduced to plus three under reaction conditions. So we create vacancies in the uh, oxide. You look at the in situ infrared, and you see that as you add more and more cerium, things change. Uh, you go from having some linear and bridged uh, hydroxides to law, all, all, almost completely bridged hydroxyl groups. And these hydroxyl groups start to interact with CO more and more aggressively as one puts in uh, uh, the uh, cerium. i show you that here. <coughs> here are the, all these catalysts. Here's the CO absorption capacity per square meter. You can see a systematic increase here by a factor of three, 
But re what's really intriguing is the hydrogen absorption capacity. This goes from 0.3 to 3, a factor of 10 uh, increase. So adding cerium uh, has two benefits, uh, a smaller benefit on the CO absorption capacity and a larger benefit, order of magnitude, on hydrogen absorption. And remember, you need both CO and hydrogen to make this chemistry go. So we're coming towards the end of the story here. Um, here we plot the apparent rate coefficient for that last step of making methanol. It's this step over here in the cycle versus the cerium content. You notice that goes through a peak. And that is not exactly like the peak in the hydrogen can absorption capacity, but it's similar. So it's suggestive that what is changing here as we go from here to here is the hidden variable, which is the coverage by hydrogen. That's a large part of it. And here we propose a little cycle to explain how cerium-3 gets involved, it gets reoxidized to cerium-4, and then we go around this <coughs> reduction, redox cycle on the way to making methanol. So I've shown you many results, all relating to how one can take apart uh, complex chemistries happening on catalyst surfaces using both experiment and guided by theory. Uh, in the first example, relating to ODH, oxidative dehydrogenation of alkanes, we've shown you that the highest specific activity is observed near one monolayer, where you get these polyvanidates. This activity is inversely related to the uh, band edge energy. And why? The kinetics are well described by a microkinetic model and that the dynamics of VOX uh, reduction and reoxidation can be understood from UV visible experiments, transient response experiments. Then in the second example, we looked at N2O decomposition on dimers and monomers of iron. Uh, we found that both of these are active. Uh, we can describe the N2O decomposition in terms of first principles. This is satisfying because uh, if you use a context-free theory, in other words, a theory that wasn't developed for a specific uh, purpose, uh, you uh, should be able to explain what you see experimentally if you have the facts right. And that works in this case. We found that water deactivates the iron but has, uh, can be offset by NO. And then in the last two examples, we first showed that uh, methane oxidation will occur on these isolated molybdates and that they have the structure shown here. They're dioxo, not monooxo. And that the, uh, uh, this is uh, then partially reduced in situ. You form a uh, peroxo, and that's what attacks the, meth the methane to make formaldehyde over here. And again, you can get the kinetics more or less right from first principles. And then the last example, I showed you that uh, copper on zirconia is a bifunctional catalyst, so both the zirconia and the copper are active. If you add Syria, you can make the catalyst even more active. And uh, that uh, there's a complicated chemistry that occurs, we don't understand it completely, that involves copper as the source of hydrogen, but the oxide as the active component. <coughs> so many people contributed to this. <coughs> I've had the pleasure in my 40-year uh, career at Berkeley to work with well over 100 graduate students and nearly as many postdoctoral Associates. This is a small subset. Uh, Kai Dong Chen and Morris Argyle uh, were the principal contributors to the story I told you on oxidative dehydrogenation. Ben Wood did the experimental work on N2O decomposition. Andreas Haydn and Niels Hansen, who got their degrees from the University of Kyle, uh, from the University of Hamburg, were working with Friedrich Kyle and myself, did the theoretical work. Nick Oler did the experimental work on the methane to formaldehyde. Shaji Chempak did the theoretical work there. And Ian Fisher, Mike Rhodes, and Konstantin Pakrovsky did the experimental work on methanol synthesis. And I also have to acknowledge the two people I've shown here, the chair of our session and the man who introduced me, uh, Enrique Iglesia, with whom I've uh, collaborated ever since he joined Berkeley in this area of uh, oxidation of alkanes. Arup Chakraborty, now a former member of the Berkeley team, got me started in using theory, quantum theory, and applying it to catalysis. Arup has now moved to MIT. And all this work was supported by either the Department of Energy or by BP through the Methane Co uh, 
conversion cooperative. Now, before I end, I want to come back to where I started. Uh, I've had the pleasure over something approximating better than 30 years of knowing Michelle and Marina. And as I said at the beginning, we've uh, spent many happy occasions together. I just wanted to share two of these with you. So this is a few years back when we celebrated Enrique's receiving the Wilhelm Award in San Francisco. We had a very nice uh, dinner. Uh, and here we are just before we sat down to dinner. And there's Enrique with his wife, Terry. Uh, and most importantly, here's Michelle, surrounded by two beautiful women. On his right is Marina, his wife, his love, and his support. And on his left is my wife, who does the same for me, uh, Tatiana, who's sitting here in the front row. I hope you'll get to meet her later, and myself on the right. And then a few years later, this is 2004 at the International Congress in Paris. Uh, we celebrated Michelle's 80th birthday there. And again, he's, you can see he likes uh, attractive women to be around him. Uh, so in this case, uh, it's again Tatiana, and this is Tamara Panov, and here is Gennady Panov. They're close friends of ours from the Boreskov Institute of Catalysis in Novosibirsk. So with that, I bring this uh, uh, lecture to a close. Again, I'd like to thank all who made this possible. It's been a great honor for me to be here. And I'm very happy to have had this opportunity. Thank you very much. I'm May Fair Cone of Western University. Um, for isolated molybdenum, I wouldn't, uh, <coughs> silica would not be my choice of the support. The fact that you chose silica, is it because it stabilized the dioxyl molybdenum better than the monoxyl? Uh, no, the reason we chose it is we looked at uh, the literature on formaldehyde stability on various oxide supports. And the one it's most stable on, it's not stable on any, but the most stable is on silica. It's uh, terrible on titania or zirconia, it's bad on alumina, and it's best on silica. So that's the reason. And Peter? I had a question on the same system. So I think you said that the uh, Klein calculations indicated that the two structures, the monooxyl and the dioxyl, were close enough that it couldn't tell which one was the more stable one. But then in the experiment, you only see one and you don't see both. Right. So it seems like somebody's having a problem. Either the calculation's having a problem or the experiment's having a problem. Do you have a notion for which those might be? Well, if you go to the high temperature, uh, the, uh, the temperatures at which you do the reaction, actually, the calculations would lead you to expect the dioxyl to be the more stable one. But a lot of the experiments are done starting from room temperature in as-prepared materials. So if you start there, you have this ambiguity. Uh, if you go to high temperatures, you would expect from the theory to have a preference, not a large preference, but a preference for the dioxyl species. So I don't think we have a problem. I think the most com compelling evidence that we have for the dioxo is this, the agreement on the structural characterization by x -axis. Okay, I think we're ready for coffee. Okay, if there are no other questions, let's thank Alex. <laughs>